Okay, so chapter five is going to be about information technology in the business office. We're going to be talking about the types of technology, uh, machines and software and hardware that you're going to come in contact with. Um, it's going to be a pretty short chapter, though, because we don't do a lot of this uh, other than some of the specific software that you're going to have to use as a hygienist. Uh, there's a lot of software or there's, there's a lot of technology in this chapter that that we don't use as hygienists. But here we go. Learning objectives for this chapter will be to define the key terms in this chapter, discuss how the important, I'm sorry, discuss how the information age has affected dentistry and why implementing a change to a computer system is important to all staff members, describe the elements of information systems, explain the four operations of a computing device, explain how information technology can be used to increase profit profitability and the purpose of a feasibility study, understand the various general and specific task software or apps available, discuss integrated apps and list the general guidelines to follow when selecting apps. Okay, so technology. Um, Technology in the business office involves the application of computers, which means the use of computers, and associated electronic equipment to prepare and distribute information, right? We use it to not only read information, but also to store our information. As technology changes, staff members must maintain information literacy, which is a current knowledge and understanding of computers, mobile devices, the internet, and related technologies. Uh, it would be uh, pretty naive to think that um, where dentistry is right now is where dentistry is going to be in 20 years. I guarantee you it will change. If you think you're going to be using Dentrix in your office for the next 20 years, uh, you're probably wrong. Um, the information age has affected modern dentistry. If you talk to any hygienist who's been practicing for more than 10 years, they'll tell you that everything has changed. And technology has really helped the dentist and everyone who works in the dental office to be more productive and to remain on that cutting edge of technology. Um, the dental staff needs to be, ex um, should expect their duties as well as the way they work to change from time to time, right? Some form of computer usage is present in more than 90% of dental offices in North America. Let me say that again. Some form of computer usage is now present in more than 90% of dental offices in North America. So if you hate computers, there's about a 10% chance you're not using them, but it's it's about 10% is a pretty low number. And if you think about it, this book was written a couple of years ago. So I'd say there's probably less than 5% chance that you're going to not come in contact with computers at the office where you go. Some applications of information technology in the business office are outlined in your book um, in the box 5.1. Okay, so information systems is the collection of elements that provide accurate, timely, and useful information. They are made up of five different elements, and we're going to talk about each one of these in this chapter. Uh, the first one is computing devices or hardware. This is the physical things that you can touch. You can touch your monitor, your keyboard, your mouse, your tower, wherever you know you store the computer components. Um, but basically. It's a computer, physical things you can touch. Apps or software are the programs uh, that you download or install on your computer um, that you interact with whenever you are touching or using your computer. And then uh, there's data, personnel, and procedures, and we're going to talk about each one of these. Uh, if you look um, in table 5.1 in your textbook, it will give you a detailed list of those basic increments of storage for information system. Um, and I, I think they're pretty funny. It's this increments of storage for information systems. Um, I, I learned something here. So a byte, when you think of like a kilobyte, a megabyte, a gigabyte, a terabyte, um, a byte itself is basically one letter or one character worth of uh, information or storage, right? So when you think of like a terabyte, in my mind, one trillion of those seems like a lot, but um, 
you know, not, not really. So, um, you know, thank you, book, for, for teaching me something I didn't know. Computing devices or other hardware. This is a computer. Computing device is a computer. Hardware is the information system's physical equipment. So the central piece of hardware is the information system in the computer, right? Um, a computing device collects data, processes the data, uh, produces output, and stores the result for future use. Hardware can take the form of like a smartphone, a tablet, a notebook, a handheld device, a headset, a laptop, a card reader, a digital pen, or a desktop computer. Uh, digital technology can help to enhance productivity and customer service in a dental office. If you go in your book in box 5.3 in the textbook, it will discuss features to consider when selecting or using copiers. Uh, box 5.4 in your textbook discusses features to consider when selecting a calculator, which I don't know, I guess I just uh, take that for granted. Uh, understanding how to buy a calculator, but hey, you know. Uh, a mobile device is a computing device or computer that is small enough to be held in your hand. Popular types include smartphones, digital cameras, portable media players, and ebook readers. Um, additional digital hardware includes from your right here from the slide uh, telephone systems with voicemail or paging, voice headsets fax machines, copy machines, calculators, digital imagers, scanners, and digital cameras. Okay, so apps and software. Um, the computer system is directed by a series of instructions called a computer program or a software application, right? Software guides the sequence of operations the system is to perform. So the computer knows if you click in a certain place, then it should perform this action, right? Apps in the dental office include uh, dental practice management software like Dentrix or EagleSoft or Open Dental. Um, those are the ones I know. And then general purpose software like Word or um, Kodak, which most offices use to uh, to take x-rays with. Um, so there are several management programs specifically designed for dental practices. Um, there's a, a typical desktop window is shown in your book in figure 5.3. Additional general purpose programs include uh, word processing, spreadsheets, uh, and database systems. So great. Data refers to the facts or figures that the information system needs to produce accurate, timely information. Raw material or information, I'm sorry, raw material of information system. So data, which is always a, it's always a plural word, by the way, data is, is more than one, are manipulated or processed by the computer to produce the finished product or the information needed. If the data are incorrect, the resulting information will be incorrect. This is why we always talk about not using Word or a citation generator to produce your uh, references, right? Because if you put the information into the Word, the, the processor incorrectly, then you're trusting that it gives you back this finished product and it doesn't necessarily do that, right? It's limited to its algorithm. So if the algorithm isn't perfect or hasn't been updated for APA 7, or you know maybe you put the author's name in backwards and it expected you to put it in last name and then first name, but you put first and then last, then guess what? Your reference is wrong. So data is, is you know, it's great. They're, they're great softwares, but you have to be very specific about how you use them. Personnel. So in most dental practices, the administrative assistant is responsible for the accuracy of the input and output of data related to the information system and the setup and maintenance of the system. The reason for this is because everyone else has something going on in the back usually, and uh, they don't, you know, make phone calls during the day. As a hygienist, if something goes wrong with a computer in your in your office, it's probably not you who will be the person who calls IT. It, it 
it won't it won't be you um it also is kind of wrapped up in this personnel uh, if you work for a very big company you'll have it that work for your company if you work for a smaller office there's usually some it company out there that the dentist or the office manager has found ahead of time and they will coordinate having that person come in uh, we had a guy i think his name was chris that would come in whenever we were out for the day uh, usually it was like Friday afternoon and uh, he would come in and and fix whatever was going on with our computers um, there's usually a training session for the staff um, that's provided whenever a computer is installed or if you have a, a new computer software that gets downloaded um, usually there's some type of training that goes into um, you learning how to use the computer right um, if you don't know like let's say you're looking for a job and uh, they say you know we prefer for you to have known EagleSoft but you don't know EagleSoft because we use Dentrix right at school what are you gonna do where do you go where do you go to learn about this well you're going to go to YouTube okay I know this I I I don't know about anywhere else giving you this kind of advice but this is real real life advice okay go to YouTube type in EagleSoft <laughs> watch their videos um, you need to learn how to manage the main page you need to learn how to uh, input your patients information both the note and you need to learn how to put in treatment um, you need to know these things before you go apply for that office before you do a working interview interview for that office okay because if you're so far behind when you show up to work that day that you don't know how to use the computer first and then on top of that you're like unsure of how to use everything else then you're gonna feel really behind um, and I don't want that for you so you're gonna go to YouTube you're gonna watch a couple of videos you're gonna spend maybe maybe 30 minutes maybe an hour of your time prepping for that working interview or you know temping for the day at that office and when you go you're still going to tell them you're not familiar with that software they're going to show you where to click and how to do all of that they're going to give you that little refresher course about exactly how they want you to do it but you're going to have that little that little secret in your back pocket that you already know how to do this okay so if this comes up anywhere else about how to find this information how do you learn how to use a new software you go to YouTube okay that's how you do it all of the stuff is on YouTube is there um, information from the company's website like if I went to EagleSoft.com would I probably find information on how to use EagleSoft yeah I probably would but would it be as user-friendly as YouTube no <laughs> it won't YouTube is your friend okay always 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 go to YouTube see if you can't find it now if the answer doesn't exist you're looking for something very specific uh, and it's not on YouTube nobody's made a video about it yet well then by all means go read 20 pages in the manufacturers thing and and learn how to do it but you want real-world advice go to YouTube Procedures are the written documentation about operation and maintenance of the information system. Uh, so anytime you download a new software or you uh, buy a new piece of equipment, it's going to come with a user's manual and that is always a source of information for you. Um, in any of the elements of the information system, the computing device, the computer, the apps, the data, and the personnel, or the procedures are missing or flawed the entire system can be affected right so you want to make sure that you have each of these components uh, procedures that are written I'm sorry procedures are written versions of the policies that help maintain the information system effectively all right, we're moving right along information processing cycle so computers use four general operations known as the information processing cycle okay it's a it's a cycle it has first input information is put in process it thinks about the information that you put into it right computes whatever it you told it to do then it has output information that's what you read on the screen and then you have the option although the computer usually does it before you even ask for storing that information okay then you click yes and then it does the whole thing again computing devices uh, use these four operations to process the data into information okay 
So parts of a computing device. There are input devices, like a keyboard, right, where you type in the letters, a mouse where you click on stuff, touch screens, graphic input devices like a scanner, uh, and voice input devices like the headset that I am wearing that is recording my voice, right? Um, then there is a processor, which is the controlling unit of a computing system. This is usually made up of the central processing unit or the CPU. When you click on the about or settings of your computer, you will be able to see what type of CPU your computer has right and then as newer cpus come out you know yours becomes outdated um this actually happens to me uh, i bought the computer i'm recording this on because i wanted to play world of warcraft and so i needed a computer that had a good enough cpu and i had i i got one that specifically had like 12 gigs of ram because i i really wanted to be like fast and then i started playing within a year uh, my graphics card was out of date and uh, which was good because I got to learn you know in a year worth that I didn't want to play World of Warcraft anymore so I just didn't update my graphics card so anyway the central processing unit all of that stuff all of those uh, fancy little um, um, gadgets and gizmos that are inside your computer um, those are part of the processing unit and then you have output devices like a printer or a scanner um, those are both output devices, but also if you think of your monitor as being an output device, that's where you read the information from. So you can kind of also put monitor in that category. And then you have media storage, which is like a hard disk, memory devices, solid state devices, the USB flash drives are also called jump drives, uh, memory cards and cloud storage. Um, all of these are places for you to store information um, and then retrieve it later. The most common means of entering information and instructions into a computing device is the keyboard. Um, you can see this kind of information on figures 5.1 and 5.5 in your book. Um, your, <laughs> this is also telling me to tell you a laser printer, which is often called a smart printer, shapes characters through the use of light. Isn't that cool? Okay, so these are just a couple of those examples. Uh, the one on the left here, this is my favorite. You can see she's wearing this headset on her head. Um, she's actually using this headset as like a voice to text and she's writing her perio notes, her perio charting um, thing with that headset. Um, that's probably one of the coolest features I've seen and probably the most efficient. Although if you have an accent or you speak weird um, if you if you have any of those kind of things that the computer isn't able to recognize um, you're going to have a little harder of a time using um, one of these types of devices so um, you know it, it's it would be good as long as you are capable of, of um, you know enunciating it the way the computer anticipates you enunciating the words anyway um, this is also going to show you like a signature pad right here so that your patients can sign things on a computer um, I've worked in places where we have like a whole iPad and we just hand them the iPad and they fill out all their forms on that and then they hand it back to you and it's automatically in your system so that's pretty nice um, these are kind of like the main ones everybody thinks about. You know, you have your, your well, this is talking about input devices like a CD-ROM um, or a USB. It has like the little USB uh, port, um, but this is the tower that I was talking about. And then you have your monitor, um, which is an output device. See there, I wasn't wrong. And then input device with your mouse and your keyboard, printer, scanner, fingerprint scanner for security, and a barcode scanner for uh, also for security. But those are just some of the devices you can you can use in an office. Networks and telecommunication. So um, you know how when you go to make a phone call and um, you need to press nine in order to dial out at Concord, um, that's kind of what this is. So a LAN is a local area network and uh, then you have your WAN, which is your wide area networks um, and so if you think about like LANs being the com the Concord system where you don't have to dial nine and then W uh, um, ANs are like when you have to dial nine in order to reach out from your place most computers today 
will connect the telecommunications pipeline to form some type of network. Uh, local area networks connect computing devices in an office, a building, or several nearby buildings. Uh, wide area networks link computers and other devices across a city, a region, or even the world. Uh, you want to be really careful about these kinds of things in a dental office because of HIPAA. Um, if you are sharing information in the cloud, then um, or sharing information online, then it's much easier for people to hack into your system. Um, and so if you don't share information like from office to office, um, then your information is usually a little bit safer. Um, we see this a lot in if you were to call one office and you had treatment done at like their sister office, then uh, they'll be they're, they're usually not going to give you the information uh, because they don't have access to it. So, profitability of the information system. So, before any kind of equipment is updated or new equipment is acquired, the needs of the office should be identified, right? So, if you don't need that fancy new equipment, then you're probably not going to get it. Um, a feasibility study is one of the most reliable ways to determine the type of computer updates and the practice requires, I'm sorry, that the practice requires, and whether new technologies are needed. So there's some factors to consider in that feasibility study, which include the type and the size of the practice. Uh, the cost was, is probably the number one. And then any changes in the practice since the initial computer purchase, um, the abilities of the staff and the training requirements. So uh, if your office has, um, you know, hygienists who are constantly running behind because they are unable to enter notes or you know if you're always asking for an assistant to help you enter notes and nobody's ever available for you uh, then you you might be justified in asking for something like this um, like in a headset that would record um, I know other times there's like a little number uh, you know like the little number pad on the side of the keyboard I've seen some where it's connected to a really long cord and you plug it into your computer and then you can enter it from like wherever you are or if you're left-handed and the computer is set up for a right-handed clinician then you can just kind of like um, string you know the little number pad over to your side which is we had a hygienist in our office who was left-handed and that is what she did application app and software selection so this is the we're going to talk about this for a little while um, some software companies sell both hardware and software that means the company is aware of the requirements of the software and can enable the user to select the appropriate hardware to support the chosen software so if you buy your uh, you know computer from Microsoft then it might be a good idea for you to continue to purchase Microsoft items because they will be compatible with your computer. Uh, if you buy all Apple products, then you might consider staying with Apple products. Um, that's just a, uh, you know, you don't have to take that advice, but you, you know, you do you. Uh, it's strongly recommended that the office makes sure the software can provide all that the practice will need going forward. So if an office will someday want to use digital radiography, it's probably a good idea that the software provide that option when the office needs it. So if you're using some type of software that doesn't have a digital radiography component to it, then there's no point in buying that software, okay? Starting with the basic software package is usually a good idea, but the office should make certain that as much as possible, the app or the software can provide all that will be needed in the future. If you go to your book in figure 5.7 through 5.20, sorry, 5.20, to zero in the textbook, uh, there's illustrations of some of the various screens that can be accessed uh, with the commonly used software systems, including uh, 5.7 has patient information screen, 5.8 has patient accounts screen, 5.9 has patient master report, uh, 5.10 is prescription window, 5.11 is service codes screen, 5.12 is claim transaction window, uh, 5.13 is treatment plan screen, 5.14 is daily appointment screen, uh, 5.15 is schedule versus goal screen, 
Um, 5.16 is family recall feature. 5.17 is quick fill list. Um, figure 5.18 is clinical charting. Figure 5.19 is a daily sheet reporting. Uh, figure 5.20 is the annual graphics reports. And uh, every office is going to use some variation of these um, pages to look at the information, right? They want to see how much are we producing, how much do we need to be producing in order to hit our goals, um, you know, how much is the hygienist producing versus the other hygienist. So these are all you know, sort of what it looks like when you're looking for information beyond which patient are you seeing that day. Application, app, and software selection, slide three. So word processing is an important general purpose software program that allows the user to prepare a document electronically, right? Integrating word processing with the information system can improve communications with patients. Um, this is Word. Are you guys using Word or some other type of word processing? Um, I'm really only familiar with Word. So, um, you know, if you use a different type, I think I've seen um, a couple of other forms get submitted to me through other types of software, um, but I'm, I'm not really familiar with that other stuff. So uh, word processing is invaluable to the dental's practice and can be integrated with the information system to improve communications with patients. Um, so you're probably going to, at some point, write a letter to your patient. Um, if you're writing an email to a patient, which as I hygienist, you probably won't do, but if you had to write an email to a patient, I would strongly suggest that you write that email out in a Word document and then use that spell check and some of those grammar components of that before you copy and paste all of it into your email, just so it has that second set of eyeballs slash, you know, software that tries to determine whether your grammar is correct because Patients are usually pretty critical when it comes to grammar. Um, there's many word processing packages out there that include those spell check software um, that will enable the addition of words commonly used in the dental practice. Although there's gonna be sometimes you're gonna type in a word, I, it happens to me all the time, um, where my computer has no idea, it's never heard of this word before. I go back and check it like five times because I must have spelled it wrong if word doesn't know. But no, I, I spell them right. So. Uh, then you have to like add it to your dictionary. But anyway, box 5.6 in your textbook will list the common features of a word processor. Whew, I feel like I'm yelling. So application app slide four, um, an electronic spreadsheet allows the user to organize numerical data in a worksheet or table format. Um, there's daily postings and updates that can be made very easily on an electronic spreadsheet. You can also put in uh, like, formulas in your spreadsheets so like if you're in excel and you type in like equal and then you type like sum and then you have a parenthesis and then like whatever cells you want to add together uh you type like you know um maybe gosh this is hard e4 comma and uh i don't know e5 then it will do the math for you. And all you would have to do is change the values that are in these cells and it would change whatever, you know, whatever you're, you're maybe you're in E6 here and it's gonna add these two together for you kind of thing. But anyway, this is Excel spreadsheets or just spreadsheets in general are very, very helpful for adding or doing any type of numerical data information thing. It's also really great for making your tables and charts over there in, um, Excel and then sort of copying and pasting that stuff into Word. Um, application slide five. So graphic software permits the user to create graphs with numerical data. So you want to use very few words. You want to be consistent and you want to keep your graphics simple. Always, always. Common forms of graphs include like pie charts, line diagrams, and bar chart bar charts. Graphs are good a good management tool for reviewing information and helping communicate information more effectively. So if you had like a little line graph that showed how much 
production you increased for your office, um, it would be a lot more effective at having that visual for someone than it would if you just went in and said, you know, I'm producing $20,000 more than the last hygienist did. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, when you're using a graph in a presentation, you want it to be uh, consistent, use few words, and keep it simple. Integrated applications, slide one. Um, clinical record applications, so the computer can also be used as a communication tool, really, between the treatment room and the business office. This is something I'm always begging our uh, our clinic to get because uh, I don't like the slide, the sign up thing, and I feel like if there were like a little little ding on my computer that told me when you're ready, I would know so much faster. But anyway, um, I've worked in offices that have these. Um, they usually are kind of like at the bottom of your screen. It'll be like over here and it'll have um, like whichever ops you have down here and like whatever you need. So there'll be like an area up here where you can type in like needs assistance. Uh, this one would be like ready for an exam and this one would be like ready to dismiss this patient or something like that right and then down here it'd be like op one op two op three op four op five i promise my handwriting is better than this op six um, or however many apps you have right um and then so you'll just like click on whatever you need and it will send a message to whichever op you're trying to get information to or from and then they'll know when they look over uh, sometimes it'll make like a little sound for you um and it just allows you to communicate really quickly. When I worked at the um, corporate office, we had a system like this, it was called Blue Note. And basically I would do my new patient exam and I would ding for the doctor to come and do an exam with me. I, so I was ready for that. And then he or she would come into the room and do the exam. And then we would say, you know, yes, you need scaling. We can do that today. Um, you know, you need this and this and this and this and this. I would do all that stuff out. Right. I'd put all of it into the computer and then I would ding for the the uh, the insurance adjuster who worked in the front. Um, sh then she would I already put all the stuff in. So she would just hit print and then she would walk back. Um, I would leave the room and I'd go get like a drink of water. And then she would come in and she would explain to my patient, um, you know, this is how much each of those services that were recommended cost. Uh, here are options for paying for those kinds of things. Um, you know, what do you want to do today? We have time for this and this. Um, or we can bring you back on another day and we can do these kinds of things. Um, we had a really good separation there so that I never had to talk about the financial stuff with patients because I have a hard time with that. Um, but not every office is like that. Um, usually in a smaller office, um, I would tell the patient what we needed, tell them what I think we should do that day. And then I would go up front and she would print out the stuff that I needed and then I would walk it back and I would explain to my patient, okay, this is, you know, how much this is, this is how much we'd be looking at today. Um, and, you know, she'll talk about the rest of your treatment up front. And then they would say yes or no. Um, in your book, in uh, 5.7, it will list the guidelines for choosing the right apps and softwares. Systems are available for patient history taking, general and specialty charting, and treatment completed. You guys already know that because you have done it. Um, clinical records, software, and applications also reduce record containment, um, sorry, not containment, contamination, and disease transmission through record management. So this is one of the biggest reasons why uh, with COVID, we switched completely to using computer charts. And while yes, there are still a couple of hiccups as far as how to make sure our computers don't get contaminated, um, they are a lot less germy than our paper charts were. Does that mean we can't ever touch paper again? No. Does that mean every piece of paper you ever touch is contaminated? No. It just means that we, by removing paper charts, we have eliminated a lot of those porous surfaces from your operatory. Slide two. Uh, establishing procedures for computerization. Um, so the change involves a commitment of time and effort. It's, it, man, trying to make changes to an office where people are set in their ways is not easy. So change is very difficult for some people. Uh, some staff members may feel unsure, but with experience comes confidence. Um, you're new 
as a hygienist. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm still kind of on the newer side. Um, and so um, I also typically tend to be someone who likes change. I make change happen a lot in my life. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty open to it. Um, I'm not perfect, but I'm usually pretty go with the flow. Uh, if you're not someone who likes to go with the flow, then this is going to be tough for you. Uh, if you're like someone who wants a plan and you get really upset when you're uh, when you're not able to follow the plan perfectly, um, this is going to be tough for you. You're going to get comfortable with something and it's going to be really hard for you to change. And I just want you to remember that people who don't change get left behind. OK, so don't get left behind. Just just try to accept it. Change is good. Change is always good. It's scary, but it's good. OK, benefits outweigh initial resistance to change. Um, procedures have to be established in order to make sure work flows smoothly through the entire process. So from, you know, when they talk about making the changes to when the changes actually happen, it should be a fairly smooth process as long as, you know, everybody's communicating, everybody's willing to make those changes. Um, it's sometimes it's necessary to update the procedure manuals for the computing tasks for the staff members in order to train the staff in the new stuff. Uh, if your office is going to make changes, they're going to have to train you. So expect that. That's normal. Um, usually to, uh, they'll change. They'll train you when you're not working with patients, by the way. So if you go to an office and uh, you think that they're going to shut the office down for a day so they can train everybody on the new software. You got another thing coming uh, that usually doesn't happen. So usually they'll have you stay through your lunch breaks or some other time you get paid for it. Don't get don't get me wrong, but uh, usually you don't do it during patient time. Demonstrations and regular staff meetings usually help to resolve confusion or conflict that arise with those new systems. So if you're having trouble with some type of system, uh, a staff member, I'm sorry, a staff meeting or just any time, you know, a huddle, whenever that is, if you're having trouble with that, that's a good time to say something. So in summary, I'm glad to see this word, um, a well-planned information system helps make the office more efficient. Okay, I know it might seem like a hassle to implement new things, but I guarantee everything, once you get used to it and you know, you're being proactive with it, then it will work better than what you did before. Uh, I haven't spoken to a single person who used to use those giant appointment books. It used to look like this huge spiral bound notebook that sat on uh, the front desk's sort of office area and they would write in pencil people's appointments right and um the, everything was kept in paper charts and then all of the information like for the patient was in their chart but then all of the information about their appointment was on this book right just this giant book where everything was written in pencil by hand okay i i don't know about y'all but that's that seems tedious to me, uh, trying to see, oh, that's the person who's there. Now let me go find that person's chart so I can find their phone number so that I can call them and see if they're coming for their appointment today. Mm, no, thank you. I'd rather just do, like right click on the little button on the computer and know their phone number right away. Okay. Eventually I'm going to be able to right click on it and call them from the computer, but you know, we're not there yet. So, um, a combination of an experienced staff member and a high-tech equipment results in a higher productivity level, better patient relations, and a happier staff. So just be patient with them. You, you got it. Um, a digital system's primary advantage is the accuracy and quality of its end product. So computers have made our lives so much simpler. Uh, I, for one, am glad I'm not handwriting things anymore. When I first started at the office, I, I first started out, we were writing paper charts. And, um, you know, I, I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, I also had to write in green pen and uh, and sometimes, you know, my green pen wouldn't work properly and I'd have to hunt down a new one. And I'm just technology has made all of our lives better. So that's it for this chapter. If you have any questions, please, please let me know.